I'm John Heilman. And I'm Mark Halpern. With all due respect to Rick Perry, this one's for free. On the show tonight, Clinton, Perry, Paul, and Cruz. But first, Trump. He's ahead in Iowa and New Hampshire, and new polls out today. And if he leads the race, as we've seen, he dominates. The latest Republican candidate strategy to deal with Trump? Talk about Hillary Clinton. Tonight at the Reagan Library, Jeb Bush plans in a big speech to hit the Democratic frontrunner in advance excerpts. He's quoted as saying, ISIS grew while the United States disengaged from middle, the Middle East and ignored the threat. And where was Secretary of State Clinton in all of this? Yesterday, Marco Rubio hit back at Hillary Clinton on abortion. After she went after him, Rubio's statement said in part, Hillary Clinton supports abortion even at the stage when an unborn child can feel pain. Hillary Clinton holds radical views on abortion that we look forward to exposing in the months to come. And this morning, Scott Walker on Fox turned a question about Trump into an answer about Hillary. All this Clinton bashing and this audition to be the best at doing it actually got, happened under the Trump radar at last week's Cleveland debate. If Hillary is the candidate, which I doubt, that would be a dream come true. How is Hillary Clinton going to lecture me about living paycheck to paycheck? Probably the Russian and Chinese government know more about Hillary Clinton's email server than do the members of the United States Congress. Hillary Clinton lies about Benghazi. She lies about emails. She is still defending Planned Parenthood, and she is still her party's front runner. John, very little of that got attention because of Trump, but it's clear that a lot of Republican uh, voters would like the best Hillary Clinton attacker to be their nominee. So, so far in those examples and others, who's doing the best at hitting Clinton right now? Uh, un undoubtedly, uh, Carly Fiorina, I think, has been the strongest, most consistent, most acerbic, most serrated edged attacker of Hillary Clinton. It has not made her the front runner yet. Um, it has put her in contention in a way. And it certainly has the fact that Bush has been bad at it has been one of the many problems that is currently uh, beleaguering him. Yeah, certainly temperamentally it doesn't fit him. I think Walker's, you saw that one-liner, like with a lot of things in the Walker arsenal right now, it's a little bit rote. Yeah. It doesn't seem passionate. It seems a little canned. Fiorina, I think, has the red meat. She'll talk about Benghazi. She'll talk about emails. Certainly the base like that. I think the Rubio statement was actually really strong. It's, it's an issue on which Republicans had been on offense because of Planned Parenthood. Hillary Clinton came back after Rubio came out against exceptions on abortion. I think Rubio right now with that shows fight for the middle. Don't fight for the base. Well, I, mean, I think he's still fighting for the base, but he was strong. No, fighting for the middle. All right. Uh... Hillary Clinton has been on her own little offensive rampage this week. Like we mentioned, she targeted Marco Rubio on abortion yesterday. On a conference call with reporters today, Clinton senior policy advisor Jake Sullivan preempted that Jeb Bush foreign policy speech tonight by tying him to his brother's legacy in Iraq. And up in Claremont, New Hampshire, Clinton used an education speech to call out another Republican 2016er. You take somebody like Governor Walker of Wisconsin, who seems to be delighting in slashing the investment in higher education in his state, in making it more difficult for students to get scholarships or to pay off their debt. Mark, Mark it sometimes feels as though this is like we're in the general election, um, <laughs> the way these things are going. Uh, Walker defended himself on Twitter and shot back with this. He said, quote, at Hillary Clinton, to add Hillary Clinton, I've frozen in-state tuition rates for four years while well, you charge colleges $225,000 just to show up. Um, we both thought that Hillary Clinton was strong yesterday in taking on Marco Rubio the way she did. Um, here she's taking on Scott Walker. Can she just keep doing this day after day after day? Is this the way the Clinton a, campaign goes? It's a conspiracy. The Republicans want to talk about Clinton and not Trump. Clinton wants to talk about the Republican leading Republican candidates, not Trump, not emails. And she wants to inject energy in her campaign. So I think we're going to see this now on a pretty regular basis for the foreseeable future. Well, what she also doesn't want to do is she doesn't want to talk about Bernie Sanders. That's right. What you'd think in a Republican and Democratic nomination fight, what normally would happen is she'd be taking on her strongest challenger. But she sees no particular upside in attacking Bernie Romney, Sanders. Romney did the same thing four years ago. Right, exactly. Don't talk about his rivals. Right. Talk about Barack Obama. Yes, and, she's, and so it's, it's kind of a fascinating moment where the two people that each party doesn't want to talk about are Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders, peas in a pot. Right, so leave them out of the discussion. Right. The good thing for Clinton, and again, she wasn't as strong necessarily there right. as she was yesterday, right. but the good thing for her is she agrees with Bernie Sanders on a lot of issues. She yep. doesn't agree with these Republicans. It fires her up, and that's helpful for her Puts campaign. Her on offense, yep. yeah. All right. Rick Perry's campaign has stopped paying his staff, shifting some of the candidates' team to volunteer status because 
Money is tight right now. Not been able to raise nearly as much as he'd hoped as a former Texas governor. Rand Paul has been fighting a lot of bad he headlines himself. His so-so debate performance, not as strong as he had hoped for fundraising and bad morale in parts of his campaign, not to mention the recent indictment of two as his advisors. So, John, those two guys, Perry having trouble raising money, Paul trying to run for Senate simultaneous running for president. Will we see a winnowing of the field before Iowa? Maybe these two guys, maybe others. Or will everybody stay in until the voting? I would have said to you three months ago, no, we will see no, everyone no, no. straight through yeah. to Iowa. I now think quite possibly, and for the, the, the presumption has been that all these guys would be able to raise enough money to get through to Iowa. It turns out that in the case of Rick Perry, he's not been able to necessarily. And Rand Paul's money situation isn't very good either. Money still turns out to be really important. And although there's a lot of it in this post-Citizens United world, there's not an infinite amount. Yeah, although Perry Super PAC has millions of dollars in it. And I think if he scales back, all you need are some plane tickets, as we wrote about John McCain in 2008. <laughs> all you need are some plane tickets to show up and be on television shows. Perry and everybody else realizes that when and if, as they all think will happen, Donald Trump has some sort of collapse, there'll be a lot of instability in the race. And even if you're not the immediate beneficiary of it, you can be the last man standing. So do you think no winnowing? What's your I, answer? My hunch is still no winnowing. No winnowing. Still okay. All right. A little disagreement zone there. All right. Ted Cruz has been on a roll since the Republican debate last week in Cleveland. The crowd loved him a couple days later at the Red State Confab over the weekend. And his campaign has been bragging about big crowds he's been getting on a bus trip through the South. And he's got a new TV ad running in Des Moines, Iowa. For a century, Americans have helped heal and care for millions in need. Our values propelled extraordinary innovation. America made the world better. So how did America become a country that harvests organs from unborn children? And who has the courage to stop it? Ted Cruz will prosecute and defund Planned Parenthood. Help Cruz restore American values. Join his rally for religious liberty, August 21st in Des Moines. I'm Ted Cruz, and I approve this message. Marcus, is Ted Cruz now in your top tier of the Republican candidates? And if he's not there yet, what can he do to get he's there? He's pretty close. He's moved up in some state polls. Let's see if he moves up in the national polls. What I think puts him close to the top tier, besides the fundraising, is he's one of the few candidates who's got plausible victories in three of the early states, the first four states, yeah. and a long-term plan, the Southern bus trip for the SEC primary in March positions as a someone who understands both the short-term momentum game and the long-term delegate game. Very few of the top-tier candidates, I think, are as well-positioned as he is in those two areas. I think, you know, look, he, I think he is, uh, uh, because of the fundraising, um, he is in, certainly in the top tier as a fundraiser, and that's super important, as we were just discussing. I do think that this question of how well these multiple super PACs are going to coordinate with his campaign, how effectively that money will get spent, is still a huge question. And of course, there are still those underlying dynamics in the party that I think fight someone from his wing of the party being the nominee. I think he's right on the edge of the top tier. All right, coming up next, longtime Donald Trump advisor and friend Roger Stone, right here after this word from our sponsors. Our guest tonight is Mr. Roger Stone, a longtime advisor to Mr. Donald Trump, who's recently left uh, working regularly with the campaign, but uh, has been much in the news, not quite as much as Donald Trump, but much in the news. A um, lot of questions about your departure. Yes. Um, we don't want to talk all that much about that, but Good. Um, I want to clarify one thing. Yes. Uh, it's been said, uh, you have said, and, and others speaking on your behalf to other organizations have said, one reason you wanted to go was you thought it was wrong for Mr. Trump to be engaged in a fight with Megyn Kelly and with Fox, he should be focusing on his message. And that other people in the campaign didn't see it that way. Everyone I talked to in the campaign says exactly what you say, and they say it's basically that's what Mr. Trump has chosen to do. Were you, in fact, a lonely voice on that issue? Well, I didn't hear any other voices, uh, but I'm not going to, I'm really not going to divulge my internal conversations. I have a confidentiality agreement, uh -huh. uh, and I have no intention of violating it. So my private advice uh, to uh, Trump will remain private. I have said that I thought that the whole thing was a distraction, that, that a back and forth but, with any but, media but person. But as best I can tell from my reporting, that, that the, the, the responsibility slash blame for that lies with Donald Trump, 
not with any of the other advisors. Well, but I don't, I'm not sure that I heard anybody else uh, giving him advice that that wasn't a good idea, never mind what my own advice was. Uh, politics, as you know, is particularly at the presidential level, is about big picture ideas and getting people to latch on to them with memorable phrases. Uh, and um, I think that's what's gotten Trump to where he is in the polls, and I think it's what he needs to return to. And then, as I'm sure you heard, I was also uh, think that he was ill served by whoever leaked the fact that he had a conversation with former President Bill Clinton, which was a private conversation. I don't think it was political, but I don't know. Uh, Bill is the kibitzer in chief. He loves politics. He can't help, you know, uh, uh, giving you his two cents whether you want it or not. Uh, I do recall that um, three years ago when Trump was was uh, contemplating a run, Bill Clinton was among those who told me he should run as an independent, that the country was ready for it. Trump rejected that advice, and he remained focused at that time on the Republican nomination, ultimately decided not to run and to endorse Romney. So, um, as you know, among Republican primary voters, Bill Clinton is the devil, uh, and therefore it gives rise to all kinds of crazy conspiracy theories. You know, are the Clintons maneuvering Trump? Nobody maneuvers Trump, I assure you. Um, Roger, you remain a, um, a not an advisor anymore to, to Donald Trump, but you remain a supporter of Donald Absolutely. Trump. And I know you are confident that there's a way in which he could win the Republican nomination. Can he win the Republican nomination with the team he currently has, or does he need to change up that team and hire more people like you? Well, he needs to expand that team. Uh, he's got some very good people. I think Mike Glasner, who unfairly gets constantly in the media as a Palin guy, and he did work for Governor Palin, who I like. But he's really a dole guy, and he's got one of the best Rolodexes in the Republican Party because of his long service to my political mentor, Bob Dole. The first job I had in Washington, D.C. was working for Bob Dole on Capitol Hill. So uh, I think Glasner's a perfect example of the kind of people he needs, but you cannot run a presidential campaign uh, on a skeletal basis. It's got to be a, a larger operation. Just the challenge of getting on the ballot in all 50 states uh, so that if you are lucky and you strike fire in one of the early primaries, you're in a position to capitalize on it. Otherwise, you end up like Gary Hart. You're hot, but there's no place to go. Do you have a specific recommendation for the for, for some people he should bring on? Uh, if I did, I would, they would be uh, private between us. Okay. Uh, I'm not an employment agency for other <laughs> political consultants. Uh, you've been involved in presidential politics for a long time. You, you worked for Ronald Reagan. You told me before we started that you flew up to Albany to file Reagan's petitions on Mr. Trump's plane that he lent you to do that. Well, so. I didn't fly myself, but, right, the but he allowed us to up use on the plane. his plane yeah. to fly yeah. our petitions. The, the New York ballot process was far more onerous yeah. then than it is now. Still pretty onerous. So you've been involved in politics for a long time. I'm just wondering, tell me best case. Let's say Mr. Trump starts to do better along the lines you think, or just continues to be solid in the polls, leading nationally, doing well. Can he win Iowa? Can he win New Hampshire? Certainly can win all those places, uh, but he needs a campaign to do it, and he needs to stick to the basic message that's gotten him to number one in the polls. He's already made history in his campaign. I mean, as you know, most pundits said he wouldn't really run. This was all a publicity stunt to build the brand, and he was just teasing as he did three years ago and 16 years ago and so on. They've been proven wrong. Then they said he'll never file his financials. No way. He'll keep filing for extensions, but he'll never really file. It turns out Jeb Bush is the guy who files for, the, for, for extensions, and Trump files on time. Uh, and full disclosure. So the pundits have been consistently wrong about him. He's a larger than life figure. Uh, he, he has, I think, his greatest strength is the ability to get everyone's attention. Now the question is, what does he do with that attention right. when he gets it? Whatever his net worth is, and he, he claims it's about $10 billion, others think it's uh, about $4 billion or $5 billion, whatever that is, let's say he is liquid to the tune of $350 million or so. Is he willing to spend that money uh, on this? On the, has he demonstrated a uh, willingness? Has he spoken of a willingness? to spend that liquid uh, cash on this campaign? Well, you could argue on the one hand that you, that you, that you have to spend $100 million and you can't do this as a free media exercise. On the other hand, just proving that the conventional wisdom proves wrong again, that's exactly what he's done. He has not spent that much based on the last FEC report I saw, but he is leading uh, in the polls. There will come a day when he is facing paid television advertising. It's interesting if you look at the survey research, that uh, in all of these polls where he has performed extremely well, his greatest gains were among those 59 to 70. Those are the people, particularly in the South. Those people are inside watching television in right. the summertime. So when Jeb unloads his $100 million of dirty Wall Street money in negative advertising, or one of the other candidates, who knows, 
um, he's going to have to compete at that level, in my opinion. You mentioned Jeb Bush. Besides Mr. Trump, who do you think can be nominated at this point? Who's the universe of people who could this, win a nomination? This race is completely wide open. I mean, there's, there's Huckabee be nominated. Sure, he could. He could, could be Cruz. Could be. could be Rand Paul. Could be. Bush, Walker, you think it's that I, I wide think, open? I think, Any of I think it's exceeding. Pataki, could Pataki be nominated? Well, let's not get carried away. All right, so you think <laughs> you think basically nine or ten people could be nominated at this point? Uh, probably, yes. Yeah. And is Trump the favorite? He is the favorite today. If Donald Trump were hit by a bus tomorrow, uh, and that 20 to 25 percent of the Republican electorate that's for him right now were up for grabs, who among those people you just mentioned would be in the best position to inherit his support? Well, if you look at both the public and private surveys, uh, the second choice of the Trump supporters tends to be uh, Ted Cruz, tends to be Rand Paul. Um, very little crossover to the establishment candidates like Chris Christie right. and, and, and uh, uh, Jeb Bush. So I think it redistributes among the conservatives. What's very interesting is Trump, the non-politician, a lot of his second choice voters go to Ben Carson, the non-politician. Right, right. Those are the two standouts in this race. Interesting. The two guys who aren't career politicians. The businessman and the surgeon. We're going to have more with Roger Stone and go inside the mind of Donald Trump. Thank you. Right after this word from our sponsors. We are back with Roger Stone, formerly of the Trump campaign. Roger, we said we wanted to go. I'll help you have you take us inside the mind of Donald J. Trump. Uh, let me just ask you this first question. Who does he listen to? Um, does he listen to his family? Does he listen to his wife? Does he listen to Ivanka? Who are the voices that he turns to when he has to make big decisions? I think he definitely listens to his wife. His wife is a terrific person, speaks seven languages, terrific mother, uh, and a real, I think, a real strong supporter and, and very much in favor of this candidacy. I think a deciding factor. She finally said, Donald, you talk about saving the country and how upset you are about the direction of the country. You talk about running. You should run. Uh, when and, was that? Uh, you know, beginning of the year. I, I, I think she is a, a very, very solid. She's a great woman. Does he take political advice from Ivanka? Uh, I can't speak to whether he's... I'm not privy to those conversations. I do think that she's a great executive and, and a great uh, leader in her own way. She's doing a great job with those companies. She, he certainly respects Ivanka and she respects him. In terms of his decision making, how does he differ from other candidates you've worked with? Uh, he is a, he's a reader. Um, he is uh, he is a studier. He thinks about things. Uh, he is, uh, but he doesn't have a bunch of cronies, if that's what you mean. I mean, he, does he like Rudy Giuliani? Yes. Are they close? Yes. Does, would Rudy's opinion matter to him? Yeah, I think he values the mayor's opinion. But Trump is very much his own man. He is unlike anybody else I've ever worked for, unscripted, uncoached, unhandled. I mean, he makes the decisions. He'll he'll consider anything you want to give him, anything you want to tell him. He's very accessible, um, but he's very much his own man. I, I want to, again, just try to understand him. I'm not asking you to criticize him, praise him, just explain him because you've known him for so long. I have experienced, and I know many people have experienced him as one of the kindest people they've ever met. Just lovely, hail fell, well met, very interested in people. And yet at times, he lashes out at people with a ferocity and a negativity that's quite striking. How do you explain the, the yin and yang of that? Well, first of all, I think he loves campaigning, and you can see it. He loves people. He's having the time of his life. He likes these campaign trips. Contrast that with, say, Jeb Bush, who looks like he is slogging through it and just wants it to be over. So how do you go from that happy warrior to you're a jerk, you're well, an idiot? Because, because in business, particularly in the Manhattan real estate world, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. And therefore, one of Trump's maxims that I happen to agree with is somebody hits you, hit him back, but harder. Uh, that's fine if you're a pop culture figure. It might be fine if you're a Manhattan real estate developer, uh, a celebrity TV host. But this is a different realm, um, and I think he I think he will recognize that over time. He is um, uh, prone to uh, ebullience um, and sometimes says things that are not 100 percent strictly speaking true. In his announcement speech, he said, "You know, you can't find a, a Chevy in in China." He said the gross domestic product was below zero. Right. Oh, it's the other thing, the, yeah, it's rhetoric. The other thing he does often is he talks, he exaggerates a little bit. You know, so if there are 5,000 people in the room, there are 15,000 people, and it's always the biggest crowd that's ever been in any given place. For most normal politicians, they would get called out on that, and they, they would, that would become a problem for their credibility. Will he just keep doing that? And if he will keep doing it, how long can he get away with it? 
Well, first of all, I think he's a great salesman, and part of that is salesmanship. Does anyone really care if there were 800 people at the rally or 1,500 people rally? Well, Does for, Al, it really for Al Gore, people cared when he exaggerated things. Pardon me? When Al Gore exaggerated things, he, it, it was Well, but I don't think Donald Trump has ever said that he invented the Internet. So, I mean, uh, the... The assessment of the crowd size versus I invented the internet, I don't see the correlation. But he does these things over and over again, right? And clearly, I mean, he has part of his, his, his self promotional He's capacity. A promoter. But again, will, will, will he, do you think he'll ever come a time where that will become a problem for him? Or will he just continue to skate past it? I think he pretty much skates past it because the only guys that are trying to play the gotcha game are in the media. The voters don't care about that. The voters are interested in the larger picture. Look, the country needs a cheerleader. The country needs a salesman. The country needs somebody who will, who will, uh, who will lead. That's the problem with Jeb Bush that I think Trump himself has identified when he says, look, the guy's a stiff. The country needs a cheerleader. One of the few times I've ever ex heard him express self-doubt about anything was when John and I interviewed him a couple months ago. And we asked him, you know, will you uh, stay in this race to the end? And he said, you know what, if I'm not doing well and it doesn't look good, I'll get out. Does he think now that he's going to be the next president of the United States, or is he still thinking maybe this won't work out? Well, he's not a fool, and he's not a man to throw good money after bad. On the other hand, um, I think that's a perfectly acceptable view. I'll get in and see how it's going. Well, he got in, and it's going very well. But some people, well. as you know, some people run say, I'm going to be the next president of the United States. Others say, eh, we'll see. We, I, where I is he? he? I think he's optimistic. The last time I spoke to him, prior to my uh, resignation, and I did resign, uh, he was optimistic. Uh, he is an optimist by nature, something he and Reagan have in common, uh, beyond just seeing the big picture and being larger than life in, the, in themselves. I think he's very optimistic. If, by anybody's measure, this is going exceedingly well. He has yet to spend a dollar on paid media. Right. Uh, those, and I was among them, who said, look, after you become a candidate, it's possible that your free media coverage is going to drop off because, <laughs> you know, they need to cover the Dumbest thing I ever heard you say. Right. And I was completely <laughs> wrong about that uh, because the conventional rules of politics, so far at least, do not apply to Donald Trump, and it's an exciting thing. I know you think he should continue to threaten to possibly run as an independent candidate in order to keep leverage against the Republican establishment. And he says, if I'm, as long as I'm respected, I won't do it. What would constitute sufficient disrespect in Donald Trump's mind well, let's say, to not uh, to run as the an independent? the other four leading candidates. The New York Times reported that the other three of the other leading candidates considered boycotting this debate if Trump were there. Uh, having studied the ballot access rules in 15 states, maybe it's 19, the Republican establishment can keep you off the ballot with the stroke of a pen, or in yep. this case, a not, not including your name. So uh, he said over and over again on the stump, if he's given a fair shot, if he has a level playing field, if the establishment doesn't try to gang up on him, of course he wants to run as a Republican. He's the front runner for the Republican nomination as, as of this moment. But I wouldn't give up that leverage because I think there's a war room at the Republican National Committee of guys who sit around saying, what can we do today to try to derail Donald Trump? The ruling class is pissing their pants here. This guy is a challenge to the to the to the two party duopoly that is running the government. Now that we have gotten in you stroking your chin and talking about uh, urination, that brings this interview to a close. Roger Stone, thank you for being with us, and we will be right back. In that last segment, when I was talking about Donald Trump's misstatements, I made a misstatement of my own. I said Trump claimed there were no Chevys in China. I meant Tokyo. You corrected it. We're on twice a day at 5 and at 8. Until tomorrow, thanks for watching. Sayonara.